address, ladies and gentlemen, I think you must take the Times comment with a pinch of salt. Because it also described me as plump and untidy. And since maybe neither of those two epithets, in spite of my wife's protest, you can take the Times not too seriously. I see, incidentally, that I am not like the bishop who turned up in a country church at the invitation of the vicar. And as he climbed into the pulpit, he noticed there were only two people in the audience. And he whispered to the vicar as he mounted the pulpit steps, he said, did you tell them I was coming? And the vicar said, no, but word seems to have got out. I feel greatly honored to be invited to give this lecture. I met, as you've heard, the students at lunchtime, and I was very impressed with their friendliness and the quality of their minds. And if they are a sample of what Dundee is doing, I think the Vice Chancellor and his colleagues can be immensely proud. People from different societies, the Atheist Society, the Christian Union, various international societies, all blending together and open for vigorous discussion. And I thought that the lunchtime was a wonderful preparation for tonight's lecture. Now, a very powerful voice has been added to the Atheist Choir, that of physicist Stephen Hawking. Around the world, the headlines were full of Oh. <laughs> right. Oh, that's much better. <laughs> I now exist. A very powerful voice has been added to the atheist choir, physicist Stephen Hawking. The headlines around the world were full of it. Stephen Hawking says physics leaves no room for God. And the headlines were referring to the publication of a new book by Hawking and Leonard Mlodinoff, The Grand Design. It raced immediately to the top of the bestseller charts, <coughs> because the public confession of atheism by a man of such high intellectual profile as Hawking has had the instant effect of ratcheting up the debate by several notches. It has also, of course, sold a large number of books. Well, what are we to think? Is that it, then? Is there nothing more to say? Should all clerics resign and all churches close? Has the grand master of physics checkmated the grand designer of the universe? It certainly is a grandiose claim to have banished God. After all, the majority of great scientists in the past have believed in him, and many still do. Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and Clark Maxwell, to name a few, were they really all wrong on the God question? Now, Stephen Hawking is arguably the world's most famous living scientist. He has recently retired from the Lucasian professorship in Cambridge, a chair once held by Sir Isaac Newton. He has occupied that position with great distinction. He has been made a companion of honor by Her Majesty the Queen. He has also been an outstanding symbol of fortitude, having suffered the ravages of motor neurone disease for over 40 years. And for many of these, he has been confined to a wheelchair with his only means of verbal communication, a specially designed electronic voice synthesizer, whose instantly recognizable voice is known all over the world. And in a runaway bestseller, A Brief History of Time, Hawking brought the recondite world of fundamental physics to the coffee table, although many people have confessed to finding the contents rather beyond them. It has been called the most unread book in history. <laughs> this book was followed by several others in the same vein, which attempted successfully to excite a wider readership with the buzz of great science. Now, since his books deal with the origin of the universe, it is inevitable that he should consider the matter of the existence of a divine creator. A brief history of time left this matter tantalizingly open, 
by ending with the much quoted statement that if physicists were to find a theory of everything that is, a theory that unified the four fundamental forces of nature we would know the mind of God. Now, in this latest book, Hawking's reticence has disappeared. And he challenges belief in the divine creation of the universe. According to him, it is the laws of physics, not the will of God, that provide the real explanation as to how the universe came into being. The Big Bang, he argues, was the inevitable consequence of these laws. I quote, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, the title, The Grand Design, will suggest for many people the existence of a grand designer, but that is actually what the book is designed to deny. Hawking's grand conclusion is spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing why the universe exists, why I exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. Now, I wish to engage this evening not with Hawking's science, but with what he claims to deduce from it regarding the existence, or rather the non-existence, of God. Over the years, of course, other scientists have made similar claims maintaining that the awesome, sophisticated complexity of the world around us can be interpreted solely by reference to the basic stuff of the universe, mass energy, or to the physical laws that describe its behavior, such as the law of gravity. Hawking now joins such scientists. And his book opens with a list of the big questions that people have asked through the ages. How can we understand the world in which we find ourselves? How does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? Where did all this come from? Did the universe need a creator? Now, when one reads these questions emanating from such a famous person, <coughs> the imagination is instantly excited with the anticipation of hearing a world-class scientist give his insights on some of the profoundest questions of philosophy. But if that is what we expect, we're in for a slight shock. Because in his next words, Hawking dismisses philosophy. Referring to his list of questions, he writes, traditionally these are questions for philosophy. But philosophy is dead. It has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly in physics. As a result, scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. Now, apart from the unwarranted hubris of this dismissal of philosophy, a discipline which is well represented in his own University of Cambridge, it constitutes, to my mind, rather disturbing evidence that at least one scientist, Hawking himself, not only has not kept up with philosophy, but ironically does not appear to realize that his own book is largely concerned with philosophical questions. Firstly, his statement that philosophy is dead is itself a philosophical statement. <laughs> and that is going to be a kind of leitmotif, ladies and gentlemen, for my logical analysis of his arguments this evening. But the view that scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery is not far removed from the philosophical view called scientism. <coughs> the view that science is the only way to truth. That is a conviction characteristic of the secular movement known as the New Atheism, although its ideas are mostly only new in the aggressive way they are presented rather than in their intellectual content. <coughs> For any scientist, let alone a science superstar, to disparage philosophy on the one hand and then at once to adopt a self-contradictory philosophical stance on the other, is not the wisest way to begin a book. Nobel laureate Sir Peter Medawar pointed this out long ago <coughs> in his excellent book, Advice to a Young Scientist, that ought to be compulsory reading for all scientists. There is no quicker way, he writes, for a scientist to bring discredit upon himself and upon his profession than roundly to declare, particularly when no declaration of any kind is called for, that science knows, or soon will know, the answers to all questions worth asking. 
and that questions which do not admit a scientific answer are in some way non-questions or pseudo-questions that only simpletons ask and only the gullible profess to be able to answer. Medawar goes on to say, the existence of a limit to science is, however, made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things. Questions such as, how did everything begin? What are we all here for? What is the point of living? He adds that we must turn to imaginative literature and religion for the answers to such questions. Now, it seems to me that this point that science has its limits is extremely important. And I speak as someone who's passionate about science. I like to imagine it this way. Here's my Aunt Matilda. And she's baked a beautiful cake, and all of you are Nobel Prize winners. And I invite you to analyze the cake. So the chemist will tell us about its elements, and the biochemist will tell us something else. The physicists will reduce it to quarks and leptons, and the mathematicians will say nothing because there isn't a Nobel Prize in mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> but suppose we've got a wonderful scientific analysis of this cake. And then I say, now, ladies and gentlemen, Nobel Prize winners all, just before you go, I have a further question for you. Why did she make the cake? And she begins to grin, because of course she knows. But you can see immediately, can't you, that unless she reveals it to us, we shall never know. Not by the most profound scientific analysis, including the scanning of her brain. <laughs> It's pretty obvious that, isn't it? And yet, when she does let us know, we shall use our rationality to see if what she reveals to us makes sense. That's a very simple illustration, but it helps to answer another contemporary confusion this whole day, debate, that the idea of revelation is somehow anti-reason. It's not without Matilda. We use our reason on the world about us, on the cake. We also use our reason on what is revealed to us by Aunt Matilda. And of course, the early scientists who believed in God's two books, the book of nature and the book of his word, thought the same way. They used their reason on both because both can be regarded as sources of information. And it seems to be important that we do not think that people like myself, who stand in the Christian tradition, are shutting their brains when it comes to the understanding of what claims to be revelation. Science is limited, and Francis Collins, director of the National Institute of Health and former director of the Human Genome Project, is very clear on it. Science is powerless to answer questions such as, why did the universe come into being? What is the meaning of human existence? What happens after we die? So there's clearly no inconsistency in being a scientist at the highest level, passionate about the subject, and recognizing that science has its limits. In fact, many scientists would confess that part of the power and success of science is because it limits itself to a certain grid of questions. Now, Hawking's inadequate view of philosophy soon shows itself in an inadequate view of God. He writes, ignorance of nature's ways led people in ancient times to invent gods to lord it over every aspect of human life. He then says that this began with ancient Greek thinkers like Thales of Miletus about 2,600 years ago. The idea arose, he writes, that nature follows consistent principles that could be deciphered. And so began the long process of replacing the notion of the reign of the gods with the concept of a universe that is governed by laws of nature and created according to a blueprint we could someday learn to read. Hawking is surely not expecting us, is he, to fall for the common trick of rubbishing religion by rubbishing primitive concept of God. Yet whether deliberately or not, he confuses God with the gods. And that inevitably leads him to a view of God as a God of the gaps who can be displaced by scientific advance. 